Let the meltdown begin. MMA meltdown on the Fight Network. Let's do this thing, polar vortex style. I am Gabriel Morenci, and I might be cold as hell outside, but things are heating up uh, here on MMA Meltdown, our first show of 2014. We've got John Ramdeen joining us in studio, the Fight Network's very own, as uh, we'll hit up the hot topics uh, of the day with the Rammer, Gilbert Smith, former Ultimate Fighter, Team Jones versus Team Sonnen, recently signed with the MFC, taking on uh, Jason South, MFC debut around the corner. We break that down with Gilbert Smith. We crunch the numbers with the best odds maker in the business, Joey Odessa. We got some kick-ass videos of the week. All that and more on tonight's MMA Meltdown. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network. I am Gabriel Morenci sitting alongside the Fight Network's uh, John Ramdeen. Let's kick start 2014 with the Rammer. Uh, John, Happy New Year. A lot of stuff has happened since we last spoke. Really? Has there a lot of, a lot of things happened? Yeah, some dude named Anderson Silva, I guess, you know, <laughs> split his leg into a million little pieces or fibula and tibula. Yeah. I don't even really know what a fibula and tibula is, but I know that Anderson Silva broke his. Yes, and apparently they've been fixed since that. The UFC dumped a whole bunch of money to get Anderson Silva fixed because they know they need this guy because they are hurting in the stars department. Well, we know uh, Dana White said Anderson Silva's problems aren't as big as he thinks they are. <laughs> and we're working on the rematch uh, as it is uh, right now. He didn't really say that. I'm uh, just, just kidding. Uh, but it almost feels that way. And Anderson Silva is throwing it out there. Ed Soros says he's coming back and he's showing pictures of him. And now they're talking, we'd like to fight George St. Pierre. Did, did uh, the news not arrive in Brazil? that George St. Pierre is retired is, you know, and there's one thing that pisses me off about the MMA talk is Brock Lesnar coming back. Oh, and they're negotiating Brock and Fedor and, oh, Brock's going to be there. And, oh, he's Dana White. Oh, he just bought a ticket. And it's just, it's just so, so, you know, five years ago. You know what I'm saying? Is, is this going to be the new deal with GSP? No, the guys, the guy's retired. It's been like two weeks, John, three weeks. And, <laughs> Now he's being called out in his super fights, and you know the UFC's thinking, oh, we can talk to him. The thing is, I actually like this idea. I think if Anderson Silva, not the fight with George St. Pierre, but I think Anderson Silva's idea of if he comes back, makes the return to mixed martial arts, he's healthy, he's able to compete, screw the title. Chris Weidman's got the title. Just like I mentioned before, that Dennis Hallman had Matt Hughes' number. They fought twice. Yeah, Dennis yeah, Hallman yeah. beat him. Chris Weidman has Anderson Silva's number. So Anderson Silva should just say, you know what? I'm going to let my buddy Jacare, I'm going to let my buddy Leota Machida, I'm going to let those guys make their run for the 185-pound title, and I'm just going to accept super fights. John Jones, Cain Velasquez, George St. Pierre, whatever fights bring me the most money and entertain the fans, that's what it's all about, and I love that and idea. And also sort of hand-pick fights in sure. which he thinks he can win. Yeah, right? of course. Thanks, because if, if they're throwing that out there right now, it was obviously discussed, as you just stated. They're sitting around, Anderson's got his cast up, Ed Soros and the camper there, and it comes up. Well, we're not fighting Weidman again when we come back. No, when we come back, and certainly And it not. probably comes up, how do you feel about GSP? Silva's probably thinking, yeah, I can beat GSP. Yeah. Which I don't know if he could, actually. I don't think he would. The thing is, I've had a chance to talk to George and his team in the past, and George told me if he's ever going to fight Anderson Silva, he needs a bunch of time yeah. to yeah. be able to bulk up, to gain the, the muscle mass to fight Anderson Silva, because Anderson Silva is a monster of a dude. He walks around 230 pounds. George is like 190, yeah, yeah, 185. Yeah. That is he's, peak. Yeah, ex yeah, yeah exactly. 192 when he's as big as he is. Exactly, yeah. and he said, and if George said if he was going to go up to 185 pounds, there's a good chance he was not coming back to 170. As a matter of fact, he said he would rather go down to 155 pounds, yeah. compete there, yeah. opposed to moving up in weight. So I like the idea of super fights. I think, you know, that's what mixed martial arts really should be based on. Just give us super exciting matchups. If Nick Diaz wants to fight at 185 pounds versus Anderson Silva, you're telling me you wouldn't tune into that? No, and, and I would. And and I, I'm with you as far as this is concerned. It's supposed to be entertainment. Yes. Give us something to talk about. And let's call it out for what it is. 
you know, what, what are the UFC rankings? It's a yeah, pile of made crap. Up. It's a pile of crap. They don't mean anything. The, the UFC doesn't respect the ranking system. The only reason they did it is to make the media feel good about themselves. <laughs> so some guy, oh, I got a vote, and did you get a vote? And oh, we got a vote. Our website has a vote. Good for you. Dana doesn't care. He's pissing on your rankings. He doesn't give a crap who you think is number one and number two. And nobody does anyone else. We want to see good fights. Yeah. That's Kung Lee Anderson Silva. But Come this, on. Okay, so then this, this, you have to like this idea, then World Series of Fighting versus Bellator, which is some real fun fights that they put together here. Spong and Jackson, Douglas Lima and Paul Harris. You go down the list, uh, Shlomenko and Okami. Come on, put that together. Some, I mean, Some good fights it, on that card, which I find them, I would think, what can we do that the UFC wouldn't like us to do? It's almost like if you're a football coach. You know, would it piss the other team off if we call the timeout here, or would they prefer if we let the clock tick? And coaches are morons, and they seem to do what the other team wants them to do. You got to think, what does your enemy not want us to do? And if I'm the UFC, I'd be a little envious and like, oh, these guys actually figure it out. That's not a bad idea they have. I love the idea. I think the problem comes when you have two different promoters. Obviously, yeah. Bellator, you have World Series of Fighting. You have two different television the, networks. Yes, you have That's, Spike, yeah. you have NBC. And the problem comes down to if what happens if there's a sweep on one side? You completely <laughs> no, destroy all, your, yeah. you destroy World your World Series of Fighting goes 10 and 1, <laughs> 10 and 2. No, it's a good point. And, and then, you so, know, it's, it is, but that won't happen. That won't happen, of it course. It would be... Yes, it would. It would be pretty you know, even throughout the, throughout the card. But I think it's a great idea. I don't know if, if, people, if it was put on pay-per-view, would people tune in? I think 100,000 people, maybe 200,000. When you're looking at the UFC right now, and some of their shows are doing 300,000, and this is now yeah. essentially becoming a global brand. And I know it's different because they don't have pay-per-views in Brazil and, and throughout different parts of Europe. But They don't I, have pay-per-views anywhere besides yeah. basically uh, Canada yeah. and the United Isn't States. Isn't there internet pay-per-view other places? Like, uh, uh, you know, no, but like everyone, that's the whole thing with the yeah. UFC. They give it to everyone for free except us. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's not like, you know, people in Brazil have as much money as we do in Canada. Why are they getting it for free? Freaking UK gets it for free on ESPN. We got to pay five bucks more. Why? Because that's why. Speaking of which, why is it? I don't know if you know this. I'm going to put you on the spot uh, here. But well, they said that this UFC 169 card was going to be on free TV on Fox as part of the Super Bowl weekend. No, I just see UFC 169 pay-per-view, Faber versus Brown. It was supposed to be free. Was it? I don't think so. Yes, was it, was it, it was. Yes. It was all kinds of stories out here. Fox is doing the Super Bowl. It was part of their whole Super Bowl extravaganza. Yeah, you know, I don't know what, what, what happened there. So what do you think about uh, Faber and Burrell? What What's your take on Cruz? Uh, it's, it's a real unfortunate situation because Dominic Cruz is a very talented guy. Uh, again, yeah. we, we talked about it before. This is a guy, record of 19 and 1, the yeah. lone blemish on his record, Uriah Faber, and which he, he yeah, redeemed himself. He redeemed himself, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I mentioned the fact that he was a former WEC champion, a UFC champion. People are like, oh, what does that mean to be a WEC kind of champion? seemed like the one guy that really could compete with Burrell, too, right? I, I, I said, well, I mean, I think Faber's going to compete with Burrell. But, I mean, I go back to the fact that, you know, he was a WEC champion. Nick Diaz was a WEC champion. Uh, Carlos Condit, Brian yeah. Stan, yeah. Carl Parisian. The list goes on and on. That means something to say that you're a WEC Pettis. champion. Pettis, Benson Henderson. Henderson. Really, it's just a, a major accomplishment. And I think Dominic Cruz is just one of these guys that, you know, created a new style. He was fun to watch. It's just, just timing a, with his life, it, isn't it? it? Just yeah, bad that's, timing. Huh? That's, like, uh, again, maybe it's, it, the fact is, he, he just gets injured. There's a lot of guys out there that just... This might be for the best for him, though. The guy hasn't fought in 26 months. Awful tough to come back and fight uh, Hen and Barrett sure. in your yeah. first fight. Like you were saying, forget about the belt. Yeah. Hey, and you come back, take a nice tune-up fight, build yourself back up, no need to rush. You come back, you lose to Barrow, you're thrown into the mix, suddenly you lose again, and then suddenly your career is all messed mm -hmm. up. I don't think it's all that bad when it's all said and done for Dominic Cruz yet. I do believe that if you don't, if, you know, I, I don't like this interim stuff, but if you can't defend the belt within a year, I don't think you're the champ anymore, in my opinion. And I know it sounds ruthless and cold. If you're injured, you're injured. You know, the Chicago Blackhawks, 
can't say, oh, Mr. Batman, my knee hurts. Can we postpone the Stanley Cup for like another eight months until I feel better? No, the world goes on. Mm -hmm. The world goes on. And if the WWE and Vince McMahon can have a year rule, I think the UFC should. True, but at the same time, I think when it comes down to a championship, you got to beat the champion to become the champion. You know what I mean? So this fight with... The so, well, Johnny Hendricks and Lawler. Is that really the... Do you, do you they, consider yeah. that, do you consider that welterweight title to be the official UFC welterweight championship of the world? No. no you don't. No, it's going to take a couple of them before <laughs> we can say, well, GSP really was the champ. That's right? what it comes down to. John Ramday and everybody. All right, we got Gilbert Smith stepping up and in. Former Ultimate Fighter, recently signed with the MFC. We'll crunch the numbers with Joey Odessa. We got our videos of the week. All that and more MMA Meltdown continues. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. Uh, let's uh, do this thing. Let's send it to uh, Colorado as we're now joined uh, by a man that fans of the Ultimate Fighter show know uh, very well as he appeared on Team Jones versus Team uh, Sonnen. Recently signed a three-fight deal with Edmonton's uh, Mark Pavlich and the MFC, prepping for his MFC debut, which is rapidly approaching. Uh, Gilbert Smith steps up and in. Gilbert, welcome to the Meltdown. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, brother. How you doing? Hey, we're doing good, man. Uh, we've been looking forward to having you on the program. We've been following you on Twitter for a little while now, and uh, you know, it, it's uh, you know, it was almost cosmic as uh, you know, Mark Pavlich is a regular on this program, and you know, I got the uh, I got the tweet a couple of weeks ago saying, you know, hey, we got the card coming up. Why don't you have some of the fighters on? And at the same point in time, I was talking to Amanda early about getting you on uh, as well. So, you know what? I think it was a destiny that you end up on the program with us. Oh, uh, yeah. It was, it was fate, man. It was destiny. Yeah. So, uh, why the MFC, man? You know, I'm sure you had a lot of uh, offers and long way to go all the way to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada uh, to fight. Uh, what was it about Pavlich's company that uh, sold you? Well, it's basically, uh, first and foremost, he came at me. He sent me a great offer, and, you know, it's a great promotion. I, I watch their shows, and they always put on great uh, great production. So it just seemed like the place to be. Plus, it gives me a chance to get out the country and broaden my fan base. You know, to fight in Canada is a dream come true. You know, most of my career I fought just in, in Colorado. So to not only leave the state but to leave the country is really going to help me grow as a fighter. You know, in Canada, of course, uh, just has really embraced mixed martial arts, always has, you know, since, you know, the early days of mixed martial arts. But it seems like the, the Colorado fight scene has a strong, you know, kind of smaller than, than a lot of other states, but still a pretty strong culture of fighting goes on in Colorado. What's the scene like there? I, I, well, I have to totally disagree with you. I think Colorado has one of the uh, strongest MMA communities. We have fight, fights almost every weekend uh, throughout the whole state, uh, and, you know, and we have some decent-sized shows here. Um, and, of course, we actually have some really, really great talent. Um, uh, I think we're outside of maybe Nevada or California. Uh, you know, Colorado is like right up there, maybe in the top five. Um, but with that said, you know, we have a strong athletic background because we have the high altitude. So a lot of fighters and, and athletes would come here and train for the altitude. We have the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, which is where I live at. So we got a lot of Olympic level uh, athletes, judo, boxing, wrestlers. And of course, we have the military. So we have a lot of combatives, soldiers that love to train MMA. So I think we have a, a flourishing and thriving MMA community. No, 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 I agree. That's what I was saying. So, uh, you know, what is it? And you just you just put it all together there. The altitude's got to be a big, uh, big advantage. And Colorado as a whole, it's a great sports state, you know, from college football to, to hockey, as you stated. Um, you know, it's just all around. Uh, you know, it's a great sports scene in the state of uh, Colorado. 
But the altitude's got to be a huge advantage, uh, you know, for you guys up there. As some people sort of scoff at it, but the altitude is real, isn't it, man? We saw when the heavyweights oh, yeah, fought up there. It's for sure, bro. Come out here and train for the first three. You'll feel it. There's nobody that I, I have known that I've came out here and, and did not feel that altitude. It's, and, and you could be a like, well-conditioned athlete, and you come out here, and you're like, man, I could barely breathe. So, sucks, but you know, it makes you stronger. You seem to be kind of like a fitness freak. I know you spend a lot of time in the gym. I follow you on Twitter. You're always training. You're going from gym to gym. You got your own gym. You're training at other gyms. You're putting a lot of work in. It's going to be the first time uh, that, you know, you're fighting at a buck 70 uh, right now. Um, you know, any concerns at all as far as the weight cut is concerned? And how do you think it's going to be an advantage for you to be fighting at 170? Well, well, I, I tell you what, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, originally me and my team came together and, and asked me to drop down to 170 because I'm always fighting really, really tall guys. And, you know, and guess what? I'm fighting uh, Jason South, who is a tall guy. So whatever. But uh, for me, uh, right now, the weight cut is going tremendously well. Uh, I'm right on point. I'm not suffering. I'm not hurting. You know, this is something that probably should have happened a long time ago. It's just that I, I've had so so much success at 85 i just know for like the need of me dropping on the 170 but you know fitness and training is my life you know this is what i do as a job this is what i do as a hobby this is what i do and i study you know just for uh you know shits and giggles or whatever it, it, it just you know part of my life it's part of my family life so uh, i love fitness and making 170 is not going to be a problem you know, and uh, a lot of fighters don't like the gym. You know, they, they don't like the training aspect. They like the fighting aspect. And, you know, maybe they like the frills uh, of the sport. But, you know, to me, what you guys do, you, you have to love it because especially paying your dues early, it's not as if though there's huge money there. So if you're not embracing, you're not loving it, I think you're putting yourself in a tough spot. And you really seem to em embrace the grind right now. Yeah, um, uh... The grind can be very hard. You know, the hardest part for me is not the training per se. It's more of um, being away from my family at times. You know, just, you know, being at the gym so many hours, you know, and not being home. Sometimes I feel like I'm missing stuff at home, you know, uh, with my kids. So that's the hardest part for me. But as far as the grind, you have to embrace the process. You have to love the process. If you don't love the process, then you're not going to get the success that you want. Uh, um so to me, I embrace the process. I love the grind. I feel, I feel like I'm paying my dues. You know, when I step into that cage, I'm just going to feel like, man, I did everything possible I could do. So now, so now it's just about going out and doing it. Now you've spent uh, you spent some time in Iraq, so that obviously has to put everything in perspective, doesn't it? And I know it sounds kind of cliche to say that, but at the same point in time, you know, when you when you're in Iraq, and I know you're a contractor, you were also there as part of the army that, you know, stepping into the cage you know, might not be as intimidating to you as it is to some other people. You know, nerves don't, don't quite get, you know, the best of you. Or is it a different type of nervous when you step into the cage? Well, uh, I mean, you always get nervous. You know, I, I, I hate the thought of the thought that you cannot be nervous. And if you're nervous, then you, uh, you must be scared or, 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 you, uh, or you must be weak or lack or insecure. <laughs> You got you got two guys that are stepping in the cage that are trying to kick and punch each other in the face. H how does that not make you nervous? <laughs> Plus you got you know many of the people on TV that's going to watch you. So yeah, I, I get into the cage. I get a little you know nervous, but but the thing is is that I believe in my training. I don't think anything I ever done in Iraq or Afghanistan or actually I, I never been to Afghanistan, but anything I ever did in the military helps helps you prepare for what, what's going to happen in the cage. It's two different types of situations um however what helps me prepare for the uh, for my fights is training you know training and believing in my talent believing in my coaching believing in my in my training partners believing in my strength and conditioning believe in basically my training that's it uh, we got gilbert smith uh with us taking on jason south it's uh, the mfc no remorse as uh gilbert makes his mfc uh, debut. And before we let you go, you, you mentioned about being viewed by millions of people. You did appear on The Ultimate Fighter. A lot of fighters that I talked to that uh, that have been on that show, you know, wasn't the most pleasant experience uh, for them. They don't feel as if though they were edited 
and shown it in the, the way that they should have been, or they didn't like the coaches, or they, you know, everyone was the, the other fighters were jerk offs, and it's kind of negative. But then they say, I would do it all over again because of the exposure that I got. What did you take away from the experience? I loved it, man. I loved it. Uh, I mean, obviously, I had I had a very curious uh, experience, you know, being the first <laughs> fight in the house, and you know, and sometimes I can see eye to eye with my teammates. But I don't care about all that stuff. All that stuff is in the past. I love every minute of it. The opportunity to train with all those good fighters, to train under those coaches. I'm still friends with almost everybody on the show. We still conversate. I just went out to uh, California to help uh, Uriah Hall train for Chris Lieben. I met up with Kevin Casey. I still chat with Chell Sonnen and his coaches. You know, I, ch I chat with almost everybody from Team Jones except for John Jones. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I chat with Bubba, Josh, Dylan, Clint, Adam, Cullen, all those guys. We're going to be brothers for life. So everything about that show, it was, it was a great experience. I would do it again. Uh, and, you know, some people may have a bad experience and say, and say they hated it. Whatever. I mean, I went out there and I won the fight to get in the house and I lost my first fight in the house. And uh, But after that, I really just enjoyed the process. So I loved it, man. Now, you said you speak to everybody, you know, except uh, John Jones. And, you know, it's, it's obvious, you know, it was documented what happened on the show yet. You know, and John Jones, you know, arguably the best fighter in the world right now, pound for pound. The dude's a badass and, you know, he, all he does is just win and win. Yet the average fan doesn't really seem to connect with him. You know, or like him all that much. He seems, sort of seems to be in this, this oblivion type of land. What is it about John Jones? You were around him. You know, is he misunderstood? Is he a good guy? You know, seems to me, you know, that everything he says just sort of pisses people off. And he comes across as sort of LeBron James-ish uh, almost yeah. kind of did when LeBron was kind of being a jerk a couple of years ago. What, you know, and I met Jones years ago uh, before he was champion. I had him on the show in person. And, real laid back and humble type of kid seems to change quite a bit but what is it about jones um you know what, what's your take about this guy personally well uh you, you know i'm gonna make it pretty quick about this because uh you know uh, john jones is john jones and i only speak it for him but the fact is is uh you know he's he's a young kid that has a lot of people that's coming after him, you know, and it, it's a lot of pressure. So I can't tell you why people can't connect to him. I know I was around him from a little bit, and, and like, you know, you could see the superstar on him. But, uh, I mean, who am I to judge his lifestyle or what he says or what he does? He's under pressure that, that I cannot believe or have never experienced. So I can't sit back and, 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 uh, and try to critique him. Uh, but, uh, you know, for the most part, I think he's a good dude. You know, he's not perfect, but who is, you know? If you see me on the show, you probably say, I hate that guy Jamal, too, you know, whatever. But, uh, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you got to respect him for his fighting skills. And, you know, I think that maybe we underestimate as fans, actually, the pressure that actually is on a fighter, especially a fighter that's on the top of the mountain in which everybody's coming uh, at them uh, all the time. And uh, you got Jason South uh, coming at you. Just came off an absolute war uh, with Sam Alvey. So you know this guy, you know, can go the distance. He put in, you know, pretty much the distance in a championship a fight short of like four or five seconds right now. So this is going to be a real, uh, a real freaking war. And I'm looking, uh, looking forward to seeing the battle, uh, Gilbert. Thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us. We look forward to seeing you uh, throw it down uh, in the MFC, man. I, mean, I appreciate it. Thank you for everything. There's uh, Gilbert uh, Jamal Smith uh, with us. Uh, another uh, sharp signing uh, by Mark Pavlich. We're going to have Mark Pavlich coming on the show in the coming weeks uh, as well as MFC just keeps uh, chugging along out there in Edmonton, as does MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network. Thanks to Gilbert Smith for joining us. We wish him all the best of luck, uh, MFC. No remorse. Before we get to Joey Odessa, let's get to our videos of the week. And it's our first program in 2014 as uh, we've been off for a couple of weeks. So we've got some real, real cool videos for you uh, this week. We've got a superhero 
uh, theme uh, of the week uh, this week. Yet, uh, let's get it started uh, where we always get our video of the week started. Russia. <laughs> Moral of the story, you know. You see a dude with a black belt dressed up as a tiger, don't start pulling his tail. This, he's pulling his tail. Don't pull a tiger's tail. Like his buddy comes over. Real, real nice uh, takedown. And, you know, we, we had the Santa Claus that uh, had the nice spin kick uh, to the head. Uh, that was uh, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I like this uh, Tony the Tiger Russian edition. Don't pull the tail. All right, let's. Uh, we're talking about superheroes here. It's always you know the comic book geeks, you know DC, Marvel, and yo, know, you know Superman versus Batman versus Spider Man, and well, you know what? Once again. The Russians have put it all together for us. It's, we've got Spider-Man taking on Batman and Robin. So, Will, I've been doing this 15 years, and finally I get to see Batman and Robin take on Spider-Man. I never thought I'd be saying that. Yeah, given the circumstances that he's against two of them, if he can take one of them, well, Spider-Man starts kicking ass. The they can't both like, fight him at once. Um, I think he's doing very well. He's he's damaging one of them, well, which Robin is a good took idea. took a big knee there, Will. Yeah, yeah. And he's feeling really hurt there. You yeah. can see. And he was also doing yeah. quite a good uh, street technique. He's injured one of them. Oh, oh a great. Superman oh, punch there, Will. Which is go. ironic seeing his Spider-Man from Marvel comics. Superman punch on Batman. Oh, brilliant. I enjoyed that. And Robin doesn't want any more. Robin's off. He's gone. He's had enough. Wow. Man, there were some vicious kicks uh, to the midsection uh, there. All right, speaking of uh, vicious kicks, uh, you know, a lot of MMA fighters influenced by the movie uh, Bloodsport and the video game Street Fighter and uh, you know, Frank Dukes and, you know, the, the old school original era. And, uh, you know, give me some Street Fighter any day of the week. And uh, especially when Street Fighter comes to life. God bless us, Street Fighters. Great to be back, 2014. Some great videos of the week uh, this week. Joey Odessa, speaking of uh, greatness, the best damn odds maker in the business will step up in it. Gonna crunch some numbers with Joey Odessa. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. I am Gabriel Morenci. Let's send it to Costa Rica. It's bagel time. Joey Odessa steps up and in. Joey, Happy New Year. It's always a pleasure. How you doing? Hey, what's happening, Gabe? 
been a while. Yeah, it's been a little while since uh, we've spoken on this uh, show. Uh, we've spoken uh, on the podcast, uh, but first uh, first time we've spoken in the new year here, Joey, and a lot of stuff has happened since we last spoke on the TV show. Chris Weidman successfully defends his uh, his championship belt against Anderson Silva. Silva breaks his fibula, his tibula, and everything else in between. Ronda Rousey successfully uh, defends her belt as expected against Tate, but already an announcement with Sarah McMahon taking on Ronda Rousey. Right around the corner, actually, that fight. And Chris Weidman, Vitor Belfort, and you've been in the news, Joey, in USA Today, no less, as you set the number for Weidman Belfort already. Yeah, they opened about a two to one favorite, and they've been betting Chris Weidman, which is uh, it's kind of surprising. But I tell you what, Belfort will get some late money once they start showing those highlight reel knockouts and stuff. It's these preview shows; they're, they're so underestimated. We talk about it all the time, and I always use the same example. But you, you can't put a, a value on a good preview show and what it does for a booker or or a, you know a gambler. My favorite preview. Uh... My favorite preview show story ever is our friend Phil Baroni, our mutual buddy. Phil Baroni, who trains with Cain Velasquez, trains with him, good friends with him, telling us about how Cain's an animal and there's no way Cain's going to lose. And then he watches the countdown show with Brock Lesnar. And what did uh, Baroni tell you? I don't know. Brock's looking pretty good, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, it was kind of funny. It's like, man, I don't know. I just, you know, I don't want you to blame me. It was great. It was great. But those shows, they'll poison your mind. I don't watch them. People don't believe it. You know, I, I don't, don't watch them anymore it. either. I, I'm like you, and I've, I've done better since I don't watch it. I don't watch them at all. No emotion. I don't watch this stuff. You can't. I mean, not, you know, study long, study wrong. I say it all the time. It's not what everybody knows, and it's not what those preview shows. Everybody knows that stuff. It's in the number. It's what you don't know that can hurt you or that will win that money for you. So you said Weidman is a 2-1 to one favorite against Balfour. How much, how much of an impact where the fight was going to take place came into account here, Joe? It's almost like football. Home field advantage worth three points, right? You know, if teams are equal and, and the game, you know, the game's not a pick em, game's minus three. Because three points for home field, you know what? What did you? What would it have been? Let's say if it was in Brazil, how much of an impact did the fact that it was in Vegas have on your line? Well, they they bet it up from two hundred to about minus two fifty now, two and a half to one. But if it was in Brazil, I probably would open up Weidman a dollar forty five, a dollar fifty. I don't see much of a different fight. You know, a lot is put on this testosterone and this whole you know, the, the you know him using or not using. I don't really think it's making, you know, the results are the results. But, you know, you got fighter A against fighter B. It's there. I think Weidman wins the fight in Brazil or in the United States. And it's just a matter of how much they're looking to lay on Weidman before, you know, they come back and find, you know, quote, unquote, like, I guess, perceived value in the underdog. Now, I know, I know, Joey, you hate being asked about hypothetical fights. That, even fights that have been announced but are still a little ways away. Because as you always stated, you know, the, the, the limits are so small. People are, oh, oh, I got in at this number. Good for you. You got, you know, $25 bet in three months before a fight that might not actually happen. But there's a quick turnaround here for Ronda Rousey taking on Sarah McMahon. No one has more respect for the Olympian athlete than you do, uh, Joey, as you bring up often about Ronda. Well, she's taking on another Olympian, someone who won, you know, a silver, not a bronze medal, obviously in a different uh, element with wrestling. Um, you know, what, what kind of number are we looking at here? And, you know, do you give uh, McMahon a much better chance against Rousey than you did Tate? Uh, because the Tate number spoke for itself. Well, i tell you what, um, I see. I saw it open already at seven to one, and it, you know, it, not a lot of money probably moved this line down to four to one. But it looks about right. I, I want to like Sarah McMahon. I mean, I have a wrestling background. She's tough as nails. But what's odd is, you know, how people gave Tate such a great shot at winning that fight, yet Sarah, who's, you know, an Olympic, not an Olympian, but a silver medalist. Uh, and she's a bigger underdog than, than Misha was at post. I, it doesn't, you know, number-wise, that's why I said send limos for the math guys. 
<laughs> Joey Odessa with us, the premier combat sport odds maker in the business, and you've been busy uh, recently, uh, Joey. We talked about the volume of the cards, and we'll get to that in a second with Rockhold and Philippou right around the corner. But we also have a, a change as far as the main event is concerned, in which uh, we've got uh, Dominic Cruz out, Uriah Faber in. Faber gets a rematch against Ren and Burrell. They fought in uh, what, 2012, mid-July 2012 in Calgary. And it was kind of like Faber's low point, uh, almost. It wasn't, it wasn't the explosive, confident Uriah Faber. And he ate about 318 leg kicks. Burrell dominated him. Bad timing for Cruz, isn't it? Cruz, one of the best fighters in the world, but as soon as the UFC takeover happened, he's been hurt ever since. Faber back in, you got Burrell as a three to one favorite. Yeah, you know, favor against uh, you know in this rematch here, I opened up uh, I opened up around about three minus three twenty five, and they bet favor here. But in the first bout, it was interesting. I you know it, it closed higher. It, it what was it? It was minus two hundred. I get confused here. Um, it was minus two. Yeah, favor was this. I opened minus three hundred in the I believe in the initial bout. And or no, 325 in this bout. See, these numbers got me confused. 325 in this bout, but in the initial bout, I opened pick them, and they bet Burrell up to like minus 200, and and kept on betting them. So it's you know it's interesting that now you know Team Alpha man, look, you know Joe B just got knocked out, if I'm not mistaken, and these runs all come to an end. Again, the math guys, the streaks. Um, I think it's the right favorite. I think that Burrell wins the fight. It's on the East Coast. Favorite's taking it on short notice. Doesn't win any. You know, he's not out there winning a bunch of title fights. And uh, and Burrell arguably didn't lose a round in the first fight. I don't see anything going different. What got so significantly better, you know, with Faber, you know, I know that, that Ludwig's in this camp, and that's great and all, but, you know, it's tough to teach an old dog new tricks. Redor Belfort is an exception, but he's still doing the same things that he did in the past, except he looks, you know, 20 years younger. Robbie Lawler, same thing. You know, he's not doing anything different than he did in the past. He's just winning, and he's winning in devastating fashion. Speaking of old dogs and new tricks, word is that Anderson Silva wants to come back. At least that's what Ed Soros has thrown out there. There's been a recent report that they want to fight GSP now uh, in a super fight. And, you know, we know how Anderson Silva wanted to fight Roy Jones. Uh, and Roy Jones, after Silva loses, says, oh, I'll fight, uh, I'll fight Nick Diaz uh, in a boxing match, which, you know, how desperate is he? And is Anderson Silva going to be the Roy Jones of the UFC? Are we, are we going to be seeing Anderson Silva lose fights for the next two years and going, oh, man, you remember when this guy used to be, like, feared and he was all that? Like, why is Anderson trying to come back now? He's not going to beat Chris Weidman. It's over. Let it go. Like, move on. I, I don't get this. And... What's Roy Jones's deal, Joey? This guy wants to fight any mixed martial artist as long as he's in a boxing ring. Like, it's almost comical now. Well, they, you know, Roy's on, you know, I call it, and it's a shame because I love Roy Jones as the fighter. He cost me more money against James Tony, and I think it was 1994. Tony was a $1.60 favorite coming off a knockout of Prince Charles Williams. I thought that Tony was the best stepped in the ring, and Roy just, just, Tony put his arms, his hands down, uh, like Silva did, and he got dropped. He got up, finished the fight, but what a hard, you know, Roy Jones right now is on the Roy Jones money retirement tour. I think Holyfield, too, with his recent comments, which we won't even go there, but it's all down the Duck Dynasty path, anything for headlines. And right now, MMA is getting headlines, you know, outside of Mayweather, Pacquiao, and some other fighters. You know, they're not getting those big headlines, but Roy's still getting headlines, and Roy's ancient. You know, Roy, Roy shouldn't, you know, it's not me to judge who should be fighting and who shouldn't be fighting, but, you know, I think Roy would have beat Silva handedly, and I think he'll beat Diaz handedly if it's on the square. I mean, you're talking, again, how, you know, Roy Jones would fight you for crying out loud if the price was right. Yeah, for about half a million. What, he's going to Poland for half a million? It seems like for about, three, you know, between three and 500K, Roy will show up and do his thing. It's just, Joey, I, I, re I remember, I remember, like, you know, Roy Jones Jr. as being viewed as what Floyd is viewed now almost. Like, one of the greatest of all time, most feared. The guy used to fight Joey with one hand behind his back sometimes when he was he showing tried. up there, the fighter. He was, like, the yeah. best ever. And now he's clowning around out here. And 
I don't want to see Anderson Silva take this path, but it looks like, you know, I don't know. It just seems like that's the route it's going to go. Hey, you know what? Let's look, let's look at it this way. Uh, uh, I don't know who said it, but uh, I'd rather partner up with somebody that's, that's greedy for money than greedy for fame. Well, Roy certainly isn't greedy for fame because <laughs> no. he's tarnishing the, the hell out of his out of his legacy. I mean, he'll fight even Tony for crying out loud. Got beaten prize fighter. Another great fighter. But you know what? In the end, it's always about the money, and that's what these guys are doing. And I, how can I, you know, how can I, how can I criticize him? No, I mean, he's uh, at the end right. of his career. He's got to make that paper. You're right. Unless it's like, uh, unless he's physically endangering himself, it's never our place to tell a well, fighter. You know what? But who, truthfully, but like Chris Lieben, up. Joey. Chris who Lieben's cares? a good example. Like Lieben's a good example. Do you want to see Lieben fight again? Like even, even if. You know, you know, he wants to fight again. You really want to see him, like, really at this point in time? Let's say, you know, he doesn't, it doesn't seem like he wants to fight. And I know what you mean when we, we project when somebody should, you know, we tell a grown man, you shouldn't do this anymore when it's their life, it's their brain, it's their concussions, it's their everything. But when you look at a guy like Chris Lieb and Joey, like, does anyone want to see that again? It's, you know, Dave, it, it's a cruel world. And if Chris Lieben wants to go out on his shield and wants to, you know, be, you know, have problems later or whatever, Roy Jones, it's these guys' bodies. Let them do what they want with it. If that's the only way they can make money, if they don't have a, a proper education, people with great educations are making money. I cannot fault these guys for making money. I can fault the people around them for staying with them, you know, and encouraging it and earning off of them. But I... The individual's choice, I, I, I can't criticize that. I think people should be able to do whatever they want to do, whether it's fight, whether it's, you know, no matter what it is. I can't, I can't disagree with you on that, Joe. The only thing I can criticize uh, is you and me for taking Chris Lieben in the last fight. <laughs> with all due respect to Lieben, he can fight if he wants to. I'm just not betting on him ever again. I'll put it that no, way. No, of course not. Yeah, no, we yeah. borrowed money, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's, you know, that, that's, that's the best way of putting it. Go and keep on fighting. I'm just not going to bet on you anymore. So we'll wrap it up uh, here, Joey. Um, World Series of Fighting throws it out there. They want to go head-to-head against Bellator. Some interesting matchups, and it's all fictitious. It's not going to happen. I mean, come on. Rebney can barely get his own fighters in, into, <laughs> into the ring. How the hell are they going to make this work uh, with, with television contracts and everything? Bellator, say what you will about them, but they are the number two. I mean, they in the United States, they are there. World Series of Fighting, you know, doing a decent job, but it seems like Bellator would have more to lose in all of this. But from a fan standpoint, Joe, when you look at some of the matchups, there's some fun matchups. Our boy Shlomenko would fight uh, Okami as the World Series of Fighting did the matchmaking and put it all together. Quinton Rampe Jackson and, and Tyrone Spong. What do you think about some of these matchups? No, I tell you what, it's a great card. I love these cards like this. I love the, I love the uh, Asian card last week. I like it when people don't know who these fighters are. It's the best thing ever because you just go out. First off, you, you get introduced to something that you haven't seen before as a spectator. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, paying for it isn't a problem. I mean, well, two guys go out there. You don't need the biggest names to make the best fights. As far as this, you know, World Series of Fighting versus Bellator, you know, I think it's, a, it's, it's definitely a power play. By, I guess it would be the World Series of Fighting. But what it does is it also shows the World Series of Fighting is not stepping up to the UFC. And it's kind of a slap, a backhand slap to the face of Bellator challenging them. And then I'd, I just view it as, you know, it just goes to show there's one elite organization out there right now, whether people want to acknowledge it or not, no matter how many cards they have in a year, you know what I mean, quality, quantity, and so forth, they're just showing straight up that, you know, if you take the best of the two organizations, you could really only make one good, solid card with it. No, but I think they could 52 this year and if they might not be top to yeah, bottom. So, yeah, so yeah, let's yeah, let's let's not get crazy here and say that the UFC is going to put together, you know, what is going to be this year, 43 cards or whatever it is. I mean, Joe, I, and I love it as a better and as a sports fan and as a fan of the sport, I'm not going to bitch about it because I like seeing, you know, fighters I've never seen before. We talked about it from a handicapping standpoint. We both did very well with the Singapore card recently. But at the same point in time, I mean, John Hathaway is uh, is a main event, Joey, coming up. You know, I mean, they're starting to stretch it a little thin. Yeah, I mean, look, it's just, uh, 
I, I like to fight. I'm, you know, I'm content. I'm a better, you know, my business isn't matchmaking, isn't TV and stuff. My, my business is just to figure out. Hey, sell, know, the, sell, them, sell the books, the fights. You just make numbers for them and bat them, right, Joey? That's all you can do. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the best I can do, and I can try to, you know, and, and, and make no mistake, Fox and all these guys, it's almost, I have to laugh in hindsight back to the early 2000s when, when, you know, heck, Danny Sheridan was on the UFC and he was giving out odds. I mean, I don't know if they had that vision and if they understood that people will, that it will translate to views. Well, I tell but you, now Joey. it's on every broadcast. I tell you, if I could have bet uh, Danny Sheridan's football lines in the day, I'd be a rich man. But uh, that's another story, and we got to... Uh, we got to wrap it up. It used to always be frustrated. I speak to the bookie on Friday. This is the day b before computers in the USA Today. I'd say, man, uh, Sheridan has it at plus six. It's only plus two. He's like, yeah, I don't take Sheridan numbers. This is the real world. Uh, Joey, always a pleasure. Thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us. Hey, my pleasure, Gabe. Have a good one. There's uh, Joey. A lot of energy with Odessa in the new year here. 2014 MMA meltdown continues. We're about uh, done here. Thanks to all of our guests for joining us. Uh, the Fight Network's John Ramdean. Check him out at the Fight Network. Gilbert Smith, check him out. Uh, MFC goes down. No remorse style. Uh, best of luck to uh, Gilbert Smith for joining us. Always a pleasure crunching the numbers with Joey Odessa. Shout out to everybody here at the Fight Network and especially you at home for uh, joining us. Other than that, you're on your own. Later.